Perfect. You're the man. Yeah. <laughs> the mic seems to be working. Everybody can hear me? Good. Thanks. Thank you. All right, let's do this. So, animations. So, when you watch this on SlideShare, make sure you download the presentation so you can actually see the animation. SlideShare chops it up a little bit so you don't get the full advantage. A um, couple of the tips that I mentioned. The first one, a lot of people use Macs. Macs ship with their own version of Git. It comes bundled with Xcode, and it's usually a couple of versions behind um, the real Git, if you want to call it that. How can you tell if you're using the bundled version? If you do a Git version, you're going to see something like this, Apple Git. You don't want this. Uh, you want to download it from git-scm.com, set it up, and you will end up with something like this. This is the most recent version as of, I think, about a week ago or so. So again, I'm just glossing over these. Do this at home in your own spare time. Bottom line, check which version you have if you have a Mac. Chances are you don't have the one you want. Next up, um, Git for beginners, autocomplete. Uh, memorizing all the Git commands, branches, etc. it tends to be a bit of a pain. Little known feature, you can actually add autocomplete. It makes your life so much easier because you start typing something, for example, git check. Well, there's a couple of different commands. If you hit tab, it'll be git check out. If you hit tab again, it's going to helpfully show you a list of the branches you can actually check out. So if you work on large projects, you don't need to remember everything. It helps you speed things up. It's very simple. You download a file from um, that URL, drop it in your profile, so it, um, Bash sucks it in when it starts, and you will have autocomplete for Git. And finally, this is one of my favorite ones. You can actually change your prompt to show you where you're at. One very common mistake when you're in Git is that you forget which branch you're in. You're going to make some changes, and then you're going to realize, oh, I made the changes in the wrong place. You can actually adjust your prompt to show you which branch you're in and the state of that branch, whether it's dirty, whether you need to commit something, if it's up to date, etc. So little things that make your life easier. Um, if your shell allows you to modify your prompt, this one specifically for uh, Bash, Right, because you have these prompts that can be used, but most shells should be supporting this. All right, let's talk about Git. Right, it's misunderstood. It just wants to be your friend, right? But people see it and they, they fear it's this really scary thing. So I'm going to help you get over this. Let's start with the, the magic behind the scenes. Right, Git has three things. You have your blobs, you have your trees, and you have your commits. And there's a very specific reason I chose this imagery. So let's get started with blobs. Blobs are how Git tracks files. When you add a file to a Git repository, Git does not care about the file name. It cares about the content. You guys have probably seen these uh, checksums for files. This is how Git tracks everything. It's going to look at the content, and based only on that content, it's going to generate a unique fingerprint for the file. So if we have a file called hello, it's always going to generate this checksum, right? even the, though the name might be different. How does Git calculate this? Well, very easy. It's going to start with the word blob, literally. It's going to add a space. It's going to append the length of the content, null character, and then the entirety of the content of the file. And you can actually try this yourself, right? When you're at home, in your spare time, run this thing through this command, and you are going to get the checksum we showed you all before. Now, uh, code repositories are not static. You're always making changes, right? You have a file, and you start adding more things to the file. Every time you make a change to a file and you do a commit, Git is going to save that file. So you're going to have all the history of all the changes that you've made saved. Now, you're thinking, wow, this is horrible. This is going to eat up my hard drive. Well, if you think about it, it's not that bad. Number one, text compresses really well. And number two, because of the nature of the changes that we make, they tend to be very incremental, right? It's not like you're changing the whole thing. You have hello, then you have hello world, then you have hello world, exclamation mark. 
and these things will compress very nicely. Hard drive space should never be a concern for you. If, um, if you look at huge projects, you know, um, take a look at React, take a look at the, the Linux kernel. These projects have years and years and years of history, and they're not too bad space-wise. So we have our project, we have our files, we're making changes to these files. We know that each file has a unique identifier, and Git is saving all of this. How do we put it all together? Well, this is where our trees come in. Trees are a manifest, right? And again, this is where the imagery comes in, right? A tree is basically a trunk with a bunch of files, um, leaves attached to it. So we start a project, and our first project is writing this file called hello. I put hello in a.txt, but remember, Git doesn't care about the file name, but it still needs to keep track of things somehow. This is where the tree comes in. Your tree is basically a manifest of all the files at a given point in time. Right, so this tells you, at this point in time, also represented by a checksum, we only had one file called a.txt, and that file points to this particular blob. So we know what the content of this file should be. With me so far? Perfect. So we make a change, we add hello world, we commit it, and now we have a new tree. Because when you commit, you're creating a whole new snapshot. Right, so now we have this manifest. It also has one file called a.txt, but this particular file is pointing to a different blob. Right? We have both blobs saved, but this tree says, at this point in time, a.txt has this content. How do we tie it all together? Well, this is where commits come in. A commit is going to add all the meta information to the snapshots. So when we started the project, we created our file, we committed it, and my commit tells me, well, at this point in time, this author created this tree, and this is a quick message that he gave. This is the very first commit of a repo. The next commit of the repo, again, we added hello world. Notice that now we have a new entry here. We have a parent, and hence we have an arrow that goes from here to here. So this commit tells me, at this particular point of time, we have a tree, and this tree has one file, and this is the content of the file, and our previous snapshot is this tree over here, or this commit, I should say. So the point is that Git is gonna start keeping a linear history of everything that happened, right? You have a commit, each commit is gonna point to its parent. So um, I'm guessing most people here um, have taken data structures at some point. This looks pretty much like a linked list, doesn't it? It's not exactly a linked list, but in my experience, it's the easiest way to explain how Git works. Right? Uh, as far as abstractions go, this is the, the most accurate one that I found. So, live demo, which we're skipping because of time. And let's talk about the project again. When you start your project, you have nothing. It's empty, right? And one of the p reasons that I emphasize this part is because this is just a, a sampler of what Git does. One thing that I always found difficult at the beginning was going through tutorials online, right? Because all the tutorials have this like arrow structure and I never got this thing at the beginning. So one of the goals here is to teach you how to read tutorials and articles and things about Git because you will have more questions. I'm not gonna cover everything here and there's a ton of information available. But hopefully once you're done with this presentation, you'll be able to understand that information and be able to self-service. When we start, there's nothing. Then we have a file, and our project keeps growing. And as it grows, you're always gonna have references of what your project looked like at any given point in time, right? And think back to the analogy, right? Your project has a number of files, you have the manifest that tells you what is in those files, and you have the commit that keeps everything together. This is your metadata, this is your snapshot, and this is your actual content. Make sense? All right, let's talk about staging. When you're working, um, everybody's familiar with the process that you do git commit and at some point you do a git push. Right? But what actually happens behind the scenes? Right? I'm gonna switch away from leaves and trees and whatnot and start modifying the, uh, the analogies. Right? Let's say that we have our minor project. Right? So we have this guy who at different 
point in time is doing something different, right? The head of a Git repo simply points to the latest commit, right? I know a lot of you are thinking about branches right now. Don't think about branches. Just think about a single history, linear history, and the head simply points to the latest snapshot that we've committed. Now, of course, our code base is always going to be under work, so we're working on something new right now. We have space for what the next commit will be, right? And I'm going to call this a stage. The stage right now is our current, it's not exactly our current working directory. It's simply the manifest of the things that we want to save, right? Let's start working here. So our working directory right now matches everything because we just did a final commit. We're in a clean state. Let's make a change, right? We do a git status, we're perfectly clean. Let's do some work. So now we go to the next stage. We made a change in a file. Now we want to tell Git, uh, well, Git, tell me what's happening here in my repo. We do a Git status, and Git is going to say, hey, I noticed that you modified minor.txt, but these changes are not staged for commit. This basically says, hey, I noticed you changed something, but I'm not going to do anything with that file unless you tell me to. Right? Why do we do this? Well, because sometimes we just want to experiment and try out different things. You want to make a bunch of changes, see if something works, and then be able to roll back those changes without actually committing them to the history. So Git lets you change things. It tells you that I know you changed it, but again, unless you tell me what to do, I'm going to leave that file alone. Very nice, Git. Thank you. Well, I actually do want to do something with this file. So I do git add minor.txt. When I do this, this change that I made is going to come to my staging area, which means that when everything that's in the staging area will actually be saved once I do a git commit. Again, why do we do this? Because we want the ability to only save the things that we care about. When I do a git status, it's going to tell me, hey, you modified minor.txt, and as soon as you tell me to, I'm going to save this file. Perfect. Well, let's change one more thing. I'm going to add one more file. I'm going to add sun.txt to my project. Hey, Git, tell me what's happening with my repo right now. Well, you have this change that you made to minor. That change is ready to be saved. And you also added one more file. I know it's in the repo, but I'm not paying any attention to this file right now because it's on track. You never added this file. Okay. Uh, that's okay because sun.txt was experimental anyways. It's okay. Don't pay attention to it. Time to save. Git, please commit whatever I have on the stage. So we do a git commit. Mining is hard. It's my quick message. And everything that's on the stage will now go here, and this will become the new head of the project, right? Notice that sun.txt is still here, but it's not actually part of the history, right? It's a file, it's on track, Git lets you the ability to have mixed repos like that, where you have some things that, you're, that don't belong. This could be um, log outputs, you know, maybe you did something and it spit out logs. You don't want to commit those logs to the history, right? So Git lets you have those things in the directory. It could be a configuration file. It could be credentials that you don't want to commit, but you still want your project to be able to read them. Right? This is the advantage of this sort of thing. Before I go to the next section, any questions on this one? No, question is, will sun.txt do anything on the head? And the answer is no, because sun.txt, Git told you that it's not being tracked. It lives in the same directory as your other files. Git knows about it, but it leaves it alone. It, it is not part of the history. Question is, uh, if somebody does a pool on this thing and they need Sun or they don't need it, will Sun be part of the repo? The answer is, it depends on the project, right? If it's a set of credentials or configurations, somebody will need to manually put it there. The idea is that this will not become part of the official history. So it's something that might be duplicated. Can we keep it on a side yeah. Yep, for example. Is everything in your head on one file? 
the head is not one file. The head is simply a pointer to the latest snapshot, right? And the snapshot is the manifest of all the files and their state at a given point in time. So head is basically, this is what the project looks like right now. Let me go back there first. Sorry. Yeah, uh, the benefit of the stage is that oftentimes you'll find yourself working on many things at the same time and you may not want to commit all of them. It lets you cherry pick what exactly is going to be committed and it makes it very clear what's going to go into the history once you do a git commit. One more and then we move on. Yes, that's exactly. So the question is, how does Git know what changed based on content? Uh, it's very fast to calculate a checksum. SSH1 is very fast, so it's trivially easy for Git to simply run it against every file and see what changed. All right, our oops moments. This is the part I love about Git because it's where it shines, right? When we make a mistake, how is Git going to help us? And here we talk about... <laughs> Um, git reset. And notice how I'm slowly changing my analogies to what you will see in a tutorial, right? You'll probably see articles where you see things like this, uh, the balls and the arrows. Hopefully by now you understand how this works, right? A was my very first commit in the project, then we went to B, C, D, E. Um, e is the head because it's the latest snapshot of this project. We have our stage, we have our working directory. Everybody understands what's in this slide at this point? They're not files, they're st snapshots of states, right? A simply represents, you might have 100 files in each state. This simply tells you, this is what the project looked like in snapshot A, right? We have 100 files. You added one more file, this is what the project looks like in snapshot B, and so on and so forth, right? Git has its own uh, database, so to speak. If you look into a git enabled directory, you will see a .git directory, and within that .git directory, that's where all the different blobs are saved. All righty, so we have a clean project right now. We've had five commits in this project. We have our head, stage, working directory. Everything matches, everything is clean. All right, but let's uh, talk about the different types of resets, right? Resets lets you move back in history. There's three different types of resets. First one is soft. What does the soft reset do? Well, very easy. It simply moves the head back one place and removes the last commit from the history. Notice that it actually did not change the working directory or the stage. The only thing it did was amend the history slightly. When would you use something like this? Well, let's say that you committed something and you used the wrong message for the commit. You made a typo. You simply want to walk that back, but you don't want to actually undo the changes you made to the files. You're simply amending the history slightly. Git reset soft. Oh, by the way, and the head tilde one. Git has many ways to reference how far back you want to reset. This basically tells you from the head, walk back one. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to go into all the different ways of doing it. When you see head on, um, tilde one, it simply says, walk back one commit. So we did a git reset soft. It simply undid the last commit, but all the changes that I made are still in stage and in my working directory. So at this point, I can simply do a git commit, change my message, and we'll go back to the same place. Next type of reset. Mixed. Um, by the way, mixed is actually the default reset in Git. If you simply do a Git reset without specifying options, this is what you will get. So, same place. We just committed something. We have our head, our stage, our working directory. When I do a Git reset mixed, it's going to walk back the history, right? Let's get rid of that commit. And now it's going to go one step further. It's going to unstage all the files that I put in. Right, so my stage is now going to match whatever I had in the previous commit. When would I use something like this? Well, let's say I mistakenly committed my, I don't know, my SSH keys to the project. Oh, no, that file definitely does not belong to the project, right? So I'm going to walk back. 
I'm going to, on stage, that's going to basically take everything that would have been saved out of the stage. But my working directory remains the same. So in this case, what I would do when I do a git add, I'm going to be very careful not to include those files that were put in by mistake. Right? Quick example of how this works. With me so far? All right, now we get into the danger zone. Git reset hard. The other two are nice because they don't actually modify what you have in the working directory. Git reset hard does not do that. When you do a git reset hard, first, it's going to walk back the history. It's going to get rid of that commit. It's going to unstage your files. And uh-oh, it's going to clover whatever you had in your working directory to the previous snapshot. You know, this is when you go like, what did I do? Well, there's actually a use for this. Right? Uh, the main use case I find is whenever I need to troubleshoot something in my, in my project, I'm going to start making a bunch of changes to a bunch of files. I'm going to add logging statements all over the place. I'm going to comment some things. And then I found the issue right after half an hour of work. But I touch a bunch of files. Well, I don't want to manually go and undo every, every change that I did. So Git gives me this very nice command where I can just go like, hey, Git, just clover everything and go back to my last snapshot. And because Git saves what your project looks like at every point in time, it's going to very easily undo all those changes that you made. It will not remove untracked files. Untracked files are not affected by Git in any way. We will. I know what you're going to ask. That's actually coming in a, in a, coming up soon. Sorry. <laughs> For now, um, ignore the rest of the world. For this section, just think about you working on your computer. The next section is going to be all about working in large groups, and I will talk about those, um, those types of questions. So even if you're working by yourself, can you just comment on where all these files are supposed to be received? Is that all locally in your local drive, or is that For now, think locally. Right? For this section, just think about you and your computer. Don't worry about what happens in the rest of the universe. We'll get to this. One last question before we move on. Yes, sir. In, in your scenario where you're debugging, would you have committed? Uh, not necessarily. But you want you... to reset the latest. Mm -hmm. So would you use tilde one or would you drop that? Um, I would drop it in my example, yes. Okay. Simply do a get reset hard. It's going to take you to back to whatever you had in head. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I'll quick check on time. Okay, we're good. All right, now let's talk about cleaning up after ourselves. We've been playing with all the, the leaves and the trees and the pots, and we made a mess. Uh, one thing that's a personal pet peeve of mine are dirty Git histories. There's uh, a lot of different schools of thoughts around what Git history should look like. Uh, some people want to keep track of absolutely everything that happened in the history. Every time you do a commit, every time you push something to a repo, it might be for compliance reasons. You want to be able to audit any change that was made. Other people simply want to keep a nice, linear, clean history that tells you how the project evolved over time. So let's see what this looks like behind the scenes. Um, who has seen, seen a history that looks like this? Yeah, I know. We've all done it at some point. You know, it's three in the morning. We're tired. We just completed a round of debugging, and we just wanted to go to bed, and we ended up with something like this. Well, uh, Git actually lets you fix this very easily. All right, let's talk about Git Rebase, one of the oft misunderstood tools about Git. All right, let's do a Git log one line. This is what history looks like right now from the command line, right? Going from bottom to top. All right, let's type this command in, git rebase-i for interactive, which means that you get to tell git what to do at each step. And let's roll back four steps from the head. What's this? Ha! Ah, no idea, right? Um, if you actually take your time to read, you'll find that git is very helpful. It, it really tries to guide you on what each of these things do. So let's talk about this command because this is super useful. From the top. All those pick commands, um, the way that this works, Git is going to 
show you the information you're reading in the following format, right? You said head minus four, so it's going to show you the last four commits. It's going to show you a command. It's going to show you the checksum for that particular commit and your commit message. So what are the commands? Well, you have these things. Uh, I'm going to focus on a few of these. I'll let you all investigate in your own time. Pick basically means I want to keep this in place. Um, edit lets you change the message for that particular command. Let's say you made a mistake in a commit message a couple of um, commits back. This will let you change that. And if you want to remove something, you notice that there is no delete command. You would simply remove the line. How does this work? You're going to list all of these commands and then Git is going to walk from bottom to top and replay all of these commands. So you're going to walk back through history. You're going to script what's going to happen next. I'm going to say, I'm going to keep this one. I'm going to skip the next one. I'm going to change the message on the following one. And Git will go step by step and walk back up to the current point of history, executing each command you told it to at each specific snapshot. All right. So first off, I made a typo and I made another typo. Well, that could have really been done in a single command. So I'm going to tell Git, you know what, take these two things and make them look as if they were a single action. Right? Why do I need two commands for two typos? Doesn't make sense. So, oh, and I also wanted to kill these two commits because I, I did something and then I had to undo it. So the net effect was like I really didn't do anything. So we don't even need these commits in the history. I'm going to remove the last two entirely and I'm going to change one of those pick commands to squash. All right, so I removed them and I'm telling Git, hey, when you walk back, forget about these two commits, pretend they never happened in the history and these two just squash them together into a single commit. Git is going to tell you, oh, perfect, you wanted to squash them? Well, uh, I'm smart, but I'm not that smart. You have these two messages, which one should I keep? What does the combined message need to look like? And Git's going to let you edit so you can de decide what your final message looks like. And once you're done with this, I commented this line. I just want to change the message to something a little bit more descriptive. I finished my rebase process, and when I do look at my log, wow, look at that, so beautiful. Created a new function and updated documentation. We now have a nice, clean history. So I realized that when you work locally, yes, it's okay to have a messy history. My advice is before you actually push onto whatever repo you're working with, take a couple of minutes, look at what you're about to push, and clean up whatever you can. It's going to make life easier for other people. And personally, I like having short git histories because there's a couple of useful commands like um, git bisect, which I don't get into here. Very helpful for helping you find issues with your repo. But if you have a long history, it's going to take longer to do it. So keep things tidy. That's uh, the overall advice here. Any questions before I go on? If you've already pushed it, it's bad because then you're changing history for other people. Typically, you would do this before you push or if you work solo in your own repo because once you've pushed something to a repo, it, other people can depend on it and you don't want to change history and we'll get to this in the following section as well. Um, since you mentioned bisect, right? So if you actually squash the stuff, so you just have everything on the bisect, you have a bigger code to actually debug it. Right? So I mean like, uh, instead of like going through a small changes, you have to go through a bigger changes for the bisect to find the bugs. So it means that, does it mean that it takes more work to actually like bisect? Okay, I open a can of worms here when I mentioned bisect. Sorry about that. Um, 30 second version, bisect is basically binary search. You, let's say something broke in your project at some point and you don't know exactly where, but you have a test suite that can run and the test suite will break whenever that error happened. So you will tell Git, start here in this known good state and find where this test suite fails. So Git is gonna do a binary search. It's gonna start here, it'll go to the middle, it'll go to the middle, it'll go to the middle until eventually it finds the, where the test suite breaks and it'll pinpoint that particular commit for you. So this is why having a short history helps because it means less hops. Let's not talk about bisect anymore because it's a very complex topic. So I just want to go through basics in this one. Is there a lot of rebases that you've done? 
Uh, Git, is there a log of rebases that you've done? The answer is yes. Git keeps track of pretty much everything. Um, if you refer about the command called ref log, it'll show you all the different commands that you did. And it, Git keeps track of a lot of things in the repo. Way too advanced for this presentation, but the answer is yes. Jeff, can you comment on the general concept of repo versus GitHub? Of repo what? The concept of repo versus recently GitHub. In the next section, I will. All right. You guys are like really eager to get to the end. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about branches before we get to, to that part, because I need to establish all the basic concepts before I start talking about the larger Git universe. All right, quick reminder, linked list, right? What is a branch? A branch is nothing but a pointer to a, a commit, right? How does this work? Well, we have this repo. We have the master branch, and the master branch simply says, well, I have a, a path through the history of commits, and that path ends here. Because it's a linked list, you can work your way back to how you got to that point. Let's start working. Well, we have our master branch, but now we need to create a new feature. I'm going to start by checking out a new branch. So I'm going to say, well, let me check out a branch called develop. I now have a new pointer, develop. It's pointing to the exact same place because, well, I haven't made any changes so far. It's only natural that it points to the same place as master. Now let's get to work. Let's do blah, blah, blah. I'm going to create something, and I'm going to commit it. We have a new commit. We still have our master branch. Our master branch ends in C. If I were to do a git checkout master, these things don't exist. The master branch exists only up to C. But we have our develop branch, which has D and E. And because of the linked list nature of it, uh, it simply lives on top of the previous history that we've created. Good so far? All right, let's go back to master. Git checkout master. Now master becomes the active tip. If I do a git log, it's going to show you A, B, and C. All right, well, I'm on the master branch. Um, hey, we have to do a hot fix real quick on the code. Git commit, F. Linked list. Huh. Well, this is where the linked list analogy kind of fails, because now it's really not a tree. Certain look, it's not a list. It's more like a tree-ish thing. But still think of the concept that each commit is going to link to a parent. So the master branch now points to F, right? F is the latest point in this branch. And my history from the master perspective looks like A, B, C, F. D and E belong to a different branch. All right, now uh, we have our hotfix, we have our feature, and somehow we need to bring these two things together. It doesn't make any sense to copy and paste code because that's what we have Git for, right? You don't want to duplicate the work you did for F on your E branch. Git lets you bring that code in via either rebasing or merging. So let's talk about the two strategies. First, merge. I can do a, I'm standing on the master branch right now, and I tell Git, hey, Git, um, I like those changes that are happening on the develop branch. Please bring them here. Git merge develop. Git is going to create a, a very unique commit. This is a merge commit, and it's the only commit that has two parents. Right? So when you get to this point, Git is going to tell me, well, my project looks like ABCF plus D and E. So all of the files are here. This can create conflicts. We will get to the conflicts in a bit, right? But let's assume that the work is non-conflicting, right? We can cleanly bring these two things together. This commit tells me that, all right, at this point in time, my project contains all of these things. of the master branch. We can still continue doing work on the develop branch, and we can periodically merge back into master as needed. Let's talk about rebase. Rebase is slightly different, and this is where I mentioned about the two different schools of thoughts, right? With git merge, you see everything that happened. With git rebase, you're actually going to rewrite history, right? When you rebase, you're going to pretend as if this work happened on top of the latest branch. So let's do a rebase in this case. We're standing on the master branch, and we want to rebase the develop branch. Hey, Git, rebase this, please. Git is going to take that commit, and it's going to figure out the progression of history. 
So it's going to go, oh, well, you want me to make it look as if D and E were part of your original workflow? Perfect. I'm going to take F and I'm going to put it at the end. So my history right now looks like A, B, C, D, E, F. There's no merge commit. There's nothing that points you to separate places. It's as if my project had always looked like this. Make sense? Develop definitely exists. Um, it's here. You're simply rewriting the history for master in this case, but you can always go back to develop. You're making it look as if the latest change on master had happened on top of the work from develop. Wait, develop D and e or A, B, C, D, E? A, B, C, D, E is develop. This is really elegant and brilliant. Unfortunately, or in order for it to work, though, I have to write code that's very modular. Kinda. We are going through um, a merge section as well, where I explain what happens when things conflict. Um, I get your point, but it, in real life, code does not always work like that. You know, real work is messy by nature. You will have multiple people working on the same thing oftentimes, and things will happen. And, and this is where Git becomes really helpful, because it, it very easily points out where you have incompatible things, and Git lets you figure out how to fix them. But I'll get to this in a sec. I'm a little bit short on time, so let me move on. All right, so quick recap of merging versus rebasing. Linear history, easy to understand, but it's not historically accurate. This is probably the, the biggest drawback of this. If you need any sort of uh, audit or compliance checks on how your project got to where it is today, you do not get this. The upside is it's very easy to understand the progression of your project. Right? When you have a, a large, messy project, merging is going to give you the most accurate history you can think of, but it's a little bit hard trying to read it, figuring out how you got from one place to another when you have multiple branches committed by multiple people. All right, now we start going outside of our own universe and we need to start playing with other people. Right? This is when we start getting into all the other questions you guys asked. When we work with others in large code bases, things get messy. This is, it's natural, it's real world development. Software development is chaotic by nature. Git helps you manage the chaos a little bit. So let's talk about forking and cloning. Right? We just hired you in PayPal, congratulations, day one. Right. We have, uh, you belong to this organization and we have this nice repo. We have these three branches, develop, release, and master. You've been issued your laptop. Welcome to PayPal, let's get to work. First thing you do, and by the way, um, I'm using GitHub as a reference because this, this is what most of us will end up working with. Right. First off, we are going to fork the, the official repo for the organization so you have your own copy of it. We forked it. Now, under your name, you will have a copy of this repo. It's not in your laptop, this lives in the cloud in GitHub. Now, you need to get to work, so you need to get this stuff on your laptop. Perfect. We will do a git clone. Git clone is going to take this, and you will now have a local copy of all the three branches, all the code here. But hey, you still belong to a large team, right? People are making changes constantly to this thing. You want to keep track of those changes. You want to add this as a remote. Right. Git remote basically tells Git, hey Git, please track whatever is happening on that uh, repository as well as the one that I have. My repository, the one that I originally issued the git clone command by default will be origin. Anything else that we add, you, you can give it a funny name. Usually we give it upstream as a common name for tracking changes up there. And now you have your triangular workflow. Um, I have a friend that always gives me a, uh, pokes fun at me because he says that I always include triangles in my presentations. There we go, triangle. <laughs> All right, so how do we work? Well, we have three people in the team plus yourself. We have our repo. We have a, the history in the repo. It's Monday morning. We're all working, right? So it's your first day at the company. You start doing some work. You're working locally in your computer. You did a git commit. You push this guy up to the repo, but in the meantime, everybody else has been working. So all of these histories are out of sync right now, right? You have the, the official organization repo where people have been making changes. 
you have your fork copy, which you did on day one, and you have your local computer with some changes that you did right now. How can we bring all of these things in sync? All right, this is what things look like right now. Like you're local, um, you're sitting at your computer right now when you type git status, this is what you will see. It's gonna tell you, hey, all right, you have one change locally, I know nothing else about the current state of the universe. I tell, all right, perfect. First off, let's do a git remote update. Tell me what's happening with all of these remote repos that I'm tracking. Oh, git tells, oh, perfect, let me go fetch that information. Hey, guess what? Upstream has these three new changes, and origin remains as is. Ah, very nice. Well, uh, let me do a git rebase because I want to bring the changes that my teammates did into my repo. So I issue a git rebase. Um, I specify which repo and which branch I want to rebase against, right? So git rebase from my upstream repo, specifically the develop branch. Git says perfect. You guys remember how rebase works, right? It's going to make it look as if, as, as if this work happened on top of all of that. Perfect. Move this here. Let's bring these changes down. I am now in sync. Uh, I want to make sure that this is also in sync with my fourth version of the repo. So now I'm going to do a git push origin, which is my, the, the repo that I own, and I'm gonna push my develop branch into origin. We do a git push, this goes up, we're in sync, everybody's happy, yay. Now, this is the happy path. Let's talk about when things go, oh, before we go into when things go wrong. Um, now we wanna bring our change to the official repo, right? This is the, my contribution to the team. I wanna make it part official. I will issue a pull request. My team will review the pull request. Hopefully all tests will pass. Uh, people like my contribution and somebody is going to merge it. Right, let's say this is the, our trusted committers, the admins, you name it. Once they merge the pull request, my contribution is now part of the official company repository and I feel happy and accomplished because I committed something on day one. Yay. So let's talk about errors. That was the happy path. Everything's nice and peachy, but things often go wrong. Same scenario, right? I made a change locally. I want to update my remotes to see what everybody else has been working on. Uh, oh, sorry, before I update, I push my changes, right? So I committed something and I got really excited, so I immediately pushed it up to my origin repo. But I forgot to check what everybody else was working on. They're like, oh, uh, I cannot pull this thing because it's not compatible. Well, why isn't it compatible? Well, very easy. You're telling me that blue follows red, but when I look at upstream, I see that purple follows red, so that's a conflict. I cannot merge this thing, you need to go fix it. Huh, that's right, I forgot to rebase for my upstream repo. Oh, um, then you remember what Lenny told you to do in this nice presentation and you will go and do a git remote update. That means that, hey, now I know what happened upstream, I'm going to do a git rebase, perfect. I rebase all my stuff and now I'm gonna do a git push. So git push origin to develop. And what happens now? Boom, blows up, rejected. Then you panic. What happened? I did everything I was supposed to do here. Well, oh, all right. Um, again, Gint's gonna give you hints. Read the hints, they're very helpful. Hey, your updates were rejected because the tip of your current branch is behind. What does that mean? Well, you're doing the same thing, right? You had pushed this initially because you kind of got ahead of yourself, then you rebased, and now you're trying to push again, but you're running into the exact same problem, right? You have this version of history that is not compatible with this version right here, right? This tells you, hey, purple follows red, but up here says no, blue follows red. I cannot accept your version of the history. How do you fix it? Well, a couple of options. First one, uh, you can do a git pull against your own repo. Right, uh, this one's gonna be a little bit messy. It'll fix a problem, but it's going to create a merge commit, right? So you're gonna have some duplication of commits in here. Histories are now compatible because of this merge commit that shows you the overall state. Um, another problem that you have, another option that you have, sorry, is to force your history onto the origin, right? 
Force, as the name implies, tells Git, hey, I am the source of truth. Pay attention to me, don't pay attention to what we have there. So we can easily push this thing up and just clobber it, and we're done. We've forcefully synced up our histories. This is dangerous, right? Um, it's one of those things that has a really dark side. Do it only for repos that you own and nobody else is working on, right? So your own fork of the repo, it's usually okay to force your history. You don't want to force your history onto upstream because you're going to throw everybody out of sync. Some people are counting on one version of the history and you're all of a sudden rewriting that, it's going to screw everybody else up. So be responsible with your use of force. All right, merge conflicts, right? Back to your question about the, the perfect universe and the perfect state of things. Merge conflicts is one of the most common things you will get working on a large code base. So, how does it work? Well, we have our master branch, right? Let's say somebody else committed this. We have our animals.txt file. I like dogs. And then somebody else comes in and says, I like cats and birds. All right, so we have these two versions of the files and now we need to bring them together. Well, Obviously, we're going to do a git merge, and we will have a conflict, right? First line is fine, animals I like. Git looks at it and says, all right, this line is on both files. It's good, no problem here. Second line, oh, well, uh, this file says dogs, this file says cats. So git is actually going to make your file look like this. Like, if you open a file in the middle of a merge operation, it'll literally look like this with these markers, right? These markers are actually meant to be helpful, right? It tells you, hey, so the, um, the head version of this branch says that dogs go here, separator. The other feature branch says that we have cats and birds here. Uh, human, I'm only Git, you know, I cannot figure these things out for myself. You tell me what the right resolution is. So what Git asks you to do in this case is to actually edit this block and produce the final output that should be saved. Right, so a human goes in and says, well, you know what? I'm going to remove these lines because I actually like dogs and I like birds. I remove the markers, I leave the final state, and when I complete my merge, this is what my final file will look like. Right. This is messy, it's hard doing it by hand. So, oh, of course, we have to do a final commit on this. Right? Who likes cats anyways? <laughs> Doing it by hand is hard. Um, I recommend that you use an ID. Um, I'm a personal fan of JetBrains. Uh, they're actually here. You know, quick plug for them, but I don't work for them. I, I simply like how they present the, the tools for working with this. If you have your project in an IDE, it's going to be much nicer than solving these conflicts by hand because it's going to show you a list of all the things that have changed, and it's going to show you both sides of the story. It's going to give you a couple of shortcuts, you know, saying, hey, accept their version, use my version as a source of truth, or actually merge. And when you merge, it's nice because it'll show you version A, version B, and you can work on the final output in the middle. So, and plus you get all the, all the benefits of the ID, like autocomplete, um, error checks, etc., within this screen. So it, it helps you save on making errors. Um, this is the end of the presentation, right? I hope you've seen that Git is not this big, scary thing. Uh, it's something that's going to be very useful for you if you simply understand the basic commands. And I really hope that you get the value of understanding how to read a tutorial or an article from Git online. <laughs>